Thank you, Monique, and thank you, Bart. And uh, wow, for you guys who are watching, that was really inspirational, uh, listening to Kitty. And uh, we clearly need more bureaucrats like that, right, for us to really make this happen. So all right. So building on what Kitty is talking about, her call to action, shall I just extend this in more concrete terms? Because I'm asking about how do we go towards an inclusive internet, right? Now, inclusion is a really loaded term. I mean, it, the gut level is something very positive, right? It has a sort of positive connotation. But let's face it, inclusion demands a certain kind of exclusion of bad actors like hackers and spammers for a healthier internet. But what's safe to say is that inclusion is a kind of uh, interconnectedness of data, people, and things and demands also our understanding of the consequences of that interconnectedness, right? So um, the problem is that we continue to face and address our problems, our reforms, our policies, as if it's singular, local, and causal. And what happens when we do it? Let me give you an instance, right? What you see here is 14 thousand live cats being parachuted into Borneo Island. It's not a joke. It actually happened. 1950s, the World Health Organization decided to do good, okay? Because what was happening there was that there was malaria amongst the people of Dayak, and so World Health Organization decided to help out by spraying their lands with DDT toxin which indeed did kill the malaria, but also pretty much killed all other living things it felt like, right? A lot of little creatures, and it moved up the food chain, which basically killed all the cats and resulted in the proliferation of rats. And it almost sounds like a Monty Python sketch, but anyway, hold on there, right? So, and that basically led to even bigger problems of typhus and the plague. So, what's the point of the story is that we are looking at wicked problems such as this. Much of the kind of problems we are faced with, which are really of matter to humanity, are deeply wicked problems, which is basically, you can't see it in very singular terms. You have to look at the ecosystem, the ecosystem of relationships to see how it can spiral out of control and be very careful of the hyper-solutionism that whether it's digital tools or any kind of quick measures can offer, right? So what are the big problems we have today at hand, whether it is a you know, climate crisis or the pandemic, which is a global health crisis or data governance, right? And these are major wicked problems and we need to resolve them. And what we're getting instead of, you know, like getting a stamina and, you know, pulling up passions for global alliances to redesign and reimagine these sort of uh, interconnectedness of institutions is we get something like this, which is called the clean network by the Americans, which is basically a sort of a Bush era, are you with me or are you against me, right? The sorry, a sort of Hollywoodized good, bad, and ugly kind of uh, demarcations of what a good internet looks like. So here's a problem, right? Because you cannot offer trustworthy systems based on identity politics of if you are my ally, you're a good actor. If you're not, you're a bad actor, which is very much under sort of nationalistic terms. What we need is an offering of a sort of a global standards based at, of, in alliance with the values we hold dear today, sustainability, you know, ethics, um, so the drive of like uh, rights and inst instituting these kind of global measures, right? So we really need to move away from these kinds of clean network propositions. Now, Europe is definitely doing a better job with say, for example, GDPR, and, you know, of course, there, it's a work in progress, but it was a really first legitimate comprehensive measure where it put the citizens at the center and it was not about market-oriented reform, right, uh, which is offered by the Americans. But Europe is still got a sort of fortress mentality. Look at the reports that are coming out right now about European vision of the future of AI. 
Look at the number of times they have uh, mentioned the European values as if it's something distinct from universal values. The, this sort of exoticization or sort of fortressing that Europe wants to contain rather than collaborate. And that's a problem, you see, that really should be addressed because we need to look outward. And let's face it, being the global governor doesn't cut it because people don't get inspired by the stick without the carrots, right? I mean, we need a different kind of vision of collaboration. So the problem is the traditional aspect of mindset amongst many of the you know, European reformers is about looking at the world outside the West in very binary terms, often from colonial times. Either they are the poverty porn narratives about they are on the brink of starvation and they need to be rescued, so they're like beneficiaries that need help, or it's like Jesus Christ, they're gonna take over and they're sw gonna swarm us, and you know, we need to have this fear and protect our European citizens. But let me uh, reassure you, this is a tiny sliver of what represents the rest of the world, which is full of creativity and a hunger to make change and enormous amounts of energy to do so. And with Europe and Europe's focus on quality and value-centered design, there can be a serious counterforce to Silicon Valley and real alternatives in tech design. Because let's face it, a number of countries, whether in Latin America, Asia, Africa, have come a long way from its colonial sort of rubric, right? They've shed that identity. In fact, today, the next web, just India and China alone are the majority of the users of the internet. And I'm not even talking about Africa, which has the majority of population, and that's gonna be even the next web, right? We are talking about sometimes as high as 60% are young. And, you know, as Monique was bringing up, is I've written a book based on more than a decade of my work with users and communities out there in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and what they're doing with the internet. And let me reassure you, they have so many ideas. You just have to attend to them. You do not need to reinvent the wheel, right? And yet, we continue to be facing the problems of the sort of fictionalizing realities and the past as if that for decades it has always been a trickle down, like you innovate in the West and you disseminate to the rest. But that's not the case. If you look at batteries and the innovation of batteries, guess where and what was the push? It was because of the global South countries because they didn't have access to electricity and mobile companies and telecom realized that if we want to capitalize on the economy of scale and be successful in this, we need to offer long battery life. That's how the mobile market boomed around the global south, right? FinTech, look at China. Smart cities, look at Singapore. Light years ahead. 5G networks, again, Asia. So let's get away from this idea that it is, you know, top down, west to the rest, and let's look at them as real collaborators, right? Look at India itself. A case in point, and when I talk about a design system approach, we're talking about reconstituting entire systems of organizing. And what happens in these low resource countries is they really embark on frugal innovation and they leapfrog, they make more with less. Whether it is, you look at the Jaipur foot, which is the cheapest foot in the, in the world for $45 versus 25,000 in the US, right? In the, it's a prosthetic foot offered and gives access to millions of people. Uh, Arvind Eye Clinic, which has operated 8 million surgeries, 50% of, uh, 50 of them free, and that has really moved towards universal healthcare in more ways than anything you can possibly imagine. And then you have Geo, which has totally disrupted the data market in ways and offering extraordinarily cheap data for much of these next billion users coming online and thereby transforming and really pushing forward the inclusivity, right? So look, I wanna just say that in this time of pessimism, in this time of this, you know, let's, let's be really afraid of surveillance and all this stuff and this geopolitics of TikTok and Huawei, we are looking at only and listening to only one kind of story, which is really pushed by the Americans as part of their bigger politics. But let's listen to the other stories, right? Even a few years ago, Harvard itself was celebrating Huawei as a case study for the world to see. Why? 
Guess what? Did you know that Huawei is an employee-owned organization? It is one of the top telecommunication companies in the world, and the CEO owns only 2% of that company. So in a time where Bezos and all the billionaires are getting richer today in the United States, consolidating the destruction of the free market, we have Huawei as a case study that, you know what? Maybe you can have a different kind of uh, governance of technological uh, companies, which could create much more equity. TikTok is kind of disrupting the way in which algorithms can break out of filter bubbles and do it with very little data, which is in alignment with data minimization of the Green Deal. And I'm not saying these are great companies as whole, but let's not throw the baby with the bathwater because a lot of startups around the world in Africa, Asia, are really desperate to learn how on earth did a relatively poor country like China manage to yield so many you know, world-class startup technology company that became so massive and went against this oligarchy which is in the Silicon Valley. So let's get some answers and let's understand that pessimism is a privilege. Nobody gets inspired by pessimism, right? If you go outside the West, people are absolutely enthusiastic because the internet is giving them a, like access to a few more choices than they already have. And that really matters because mobility is driven by the fuel of hope and only hope, right? So let's start engaging the world by stop being just the governor, right? No stick and sort of preaching down, but actual collaborators of co-creation. Let's stop talking about European values and focus on universal values and looking at a shift from utility driven to aspirational. And this is how we will get ahead. And with that, thank you very much.